Uh, this, uh, my name is Dr. Mark Freumson, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and I've spent the last several decades doing joint replacements, doing hip replacements and knee replacements, teaching residents and fellows. And I can tell you, I've spent my share of my career thinking about uh, infections, treating a whole host of uh, infected joints. And I can tell you, there's there's a, a, this is a topic that's of great interest to me, and I'm delighted to be talking about this with Dr. Percival. Stephen? Thank you very much. My name's uh, Professor Stephen Percival. I've uh, been working in microbiology and biofilms for probably over 28 years now. So uh, I got into wound care over 20 years ago. So I, I look at uh, and develop technologies and do a lot of research linked to controlling infection and preventing biofilms and controlling biofilms, particularly in the medical profession. Great, thanks, Stephen. So, um, just to kind of set the playing field here, you know, I, I I think it's pretty clear to everybody who's listening that infection is really something that's a focus of ours. Patients come in for elective surgery, and if they end up with an infection, it's just a devastating complication. And we can talk about it in human terms, we can talk about it in economic terms, but but suffice it to say that. Uh, whether you're in medicine, surgery, and, and particularly if you're in surgery that involves devices, you know that uh, if, you, if, you re if your surgery results in an infection, that's just uh, absolutely um, heartbreaking for the patient and for the team. And so I think we're going to uh, spend some time talking to Dr. Stephen Percival and get some insights into why this is such a challenging um, problem to treat. Um, and I think we've heard a lot about things like biofilm uh, and resistance. And I, I want to just lead off and kind of, Stephen, get your sense of what is this thing called biofilm and why is it so important? What's its significance in our ability to eradicate infection? Interesting question. Yeah, your biofilms is uh not a relatively new term it's been probably around for 30 years but it, it started really off in in the engineering and it, it came from the the problems a lot of companies were having with corrosion of pipe systems so what was happening was they were getting corrosion and there was it was costing the oil industry a lot of money and then in the last probably 15 20 years this thing known as a biofilm entered the medical profession and they were finding that a lot of chronic conditions, a lot of infections that weren't going away, uh, they were finding traditional therapeutic interventions weren't being very effective. So a lot of clever people out there introduced the concept of biofilms within the human body. And what we know now is the Centre Disease Control has said biofilms are associated with at least 65% of all hospital acquired infections. And the uh, National Institutes of Health have also said that 80% potentially of uh, human infections and diseases are as associated with biofilms. So then comes the question, what's a biofilm? So again, there's lots of definitions out there, but we don't want to simplify this term biofilm because it's an ology. And a lot of people don't realize this. We have microbiology. And when I say analogy, and what I mean by that is it's a complicated area, but we're trying to simplify it when we're trying to control, manage what a biofilm is. So taking you back to the basics here in terms of microbiology, microorganisms exist generally in two states. They either swim around and they're called planktonic when they're in that state and it's called a phenotypic state. So traditionally, when we try to manage microorganisms within this swimming state, we've designed our antimicrobials and our antibiotics to kill bugs in that state. However, bacteria and fungi also can develop and grow on a surface. When they grow on a surface, they are called sessile, which means they're attached. And when they attach onto the surface, they coat themselves in lots of polysaccharides, proteins to help secure them onto that surface. And what happens there when they've got this sort of security, they start multiplying, start growing. 
And what happens is it becomes like a multicellular organism that starts developing in whatever environment these microbes can be found. So, so can I ask you a question on that? So are they changing their phenotype at that point? Are they changing fundamentally what their internal structure is? Or is it the fact that they are kind of ganging up as a group that makes them harder to treat? Well, when microorganisms attach onto a surface, and when I say a surface, it doesn't have to be a total uh, flat, inert surface. It can be a biological surface. It can be bacteria attaching onto each other. And ultimately, what happens is they you'll get switching on of different genes, and there's been about 90 different genes analysed and more are being uh, analysed as we speak that are switched on when a bacteria attaches onto a surface. However, what you generally find when microbes form within a biofilm, this is a phenotypic state. And what I mean by that, their, their whole biochemistry changes slightly and they become tolerant when they're within a biofilm to things like antimicrobials. But it doesn't imply there's genes giving them this tolerance to antimicrobials, which you find with antibiotic resistance. So the switching on of genes, switching off of other genes, but this is a phenotypic state that, that bacteria exist in, either attached or swimming. So in, in essence, they're behaving differently. They haven't actually changed their genetic code, but they're behaving differently and they're signaling one another in a different way than they do when they're floating around independently. Correct. And what can happen is when these microorganisms attach onto a surface, it's a bit like uh, when we go on holiday, we, we get go down to the beach, have a bit of a relax and we start chilling out. And this is what microbes do when they find a surface. They will chill there for a long period of time. So they so, can be dormant. They can just sit there and not be active, but but still be living in a in a chilled out existence. Correct. And and then this is the problem. So particularly with a lot of infections and chronic conditions, you may not think you've got microbes going in a biofilm, but they're there, they're dormant, and there's some trigger mechanism that then starts to cause them to multiply and proliferate. And so is, is, is it safe to say then that if we're giving antibiotics to an active infection, we may be treating the circulating organisms, the ones that are in that planktonic state, but the ones that are uh, protected by a biofilm or attached to a surface may not be exposed to those antimicrobials. Yeah, and, and what you've got to bear in mind, if we, if we look at wound care, for example, you're going to have your acute wound and your chronic wound. A lot of biofilms, particularly in, in chronic wounds, go very dormant and quiet. And things like penicillin, of course, if the bugs aren't multiplying, those sorts of uh, antibiotics won't work within bugs within the biofilm state as opposed to more of an acute situation where there's a lot of multiplication of microbes happening and there's a lot of communication and these are these are called uh, quorum sensing molecules that bacteria exchange between each other to tell other bacteria that they are around and we want to uh, get together as such so yeah. these things are a lot more clever than we've given them credit for they, they're oh, talking yeah. to each other. They're creating their own little homes to live in. So no wonder it's been so difficult for us on a clinical sense to really eradicate them. And, and it's really no wonder that this has been such a persistent clinical problem for those of us treating patients. Yeah. And, and the challenge we have, which uh, is fundamental in terms of biofilmology, is that a lot of biofilms contain very low numbers of bacteria, fungi, yeast, and this extracellular material actually can make up in, in certain biofilms over 80% of its composition. So what has that's, to happen when you- hard do, coding. That's a hard coating. That's a lot of protection. Well, it's a bit like, you've got to think a bit of it being very gooey. You know, think of it a bit sticky. And uh, it's an environment whereby if you're adding antimicrobes and antibiotics, they can get stuck in the matrix of the biofilm and not actually get to the bugs themselves. So you imagine the immune system, your polymorphonucleosides, your white blood cells, of course, they're not going to be able to penetrate through a lot of these biofilms and get to the bacteria. So it becomes an entity that is hard to get rid of by the body's natural immunological systems.
Now, so we now are there certain interventions in? Yeah. So are there certain um, organisms that are more likely to to uh, produce these biofilms, or or you know, is it is it sort of any organism can do it, or are there are certain ones that we know of that are just more tenacious and and more prolific in their ability to create biofilms that we have a hard time dealing with. Well, we have this thing called socio-microbiology now, which is how sociable microorganisms are between each other. So we're studying their psychology now, huh? Correct. Yeah, well, they can think now, particularly in a biofilm, we have neurological pathways now. So we, we know these microbes are, are being uh, very clever when they're growing within a biofilm. But what we have to bear in mind that we, we can take bacteria out of a biofilm and we can measure its biofilm forming potential. We can determine how well a lot of bacteria actually form a biofilm. So um, what you'll find is bacteria don't generally attach onto a surface per se by themselves. They're often attached to other bacteria and that's where they're, they're called aggregated together. So ultimately what you find is some bugs like each other. If they like each other, they combine, and that helps them to attach onto a surface a lot better. But you're generally finding a lot of bugs like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for example, are very good biofilm formers. But Pseudomonas aeruginosa from one patient, of course, will be different to a Pseudomonas aeruginosa from another patient because they'll have different genes. So it all depends, again, what microbes you find in the patient and what other bugs they like interacting with synergistically uh, w which will determine how well they attach and proliferate and grow within a biofilm so so am i hearing you right that that within a specific biofilm formation you can have more than one mic type of microorganism yeah that, that's what you generally don't find a monoculture biofilm you can find them quite a lot in orthopedic sorts of infections because a lot of the coagulase negative staphylococcus such as Staphylococcus epidermidis. Of course, that comes from the skin. That's quite prevalent, particularly on orthopedic devices, of course. Uh, but generally, you will find a community of microorganisms. And, what you, and the issue you have, unfortunately, is traditionally we've tried to culture these bacteria. And of course, we recover the most prevalent and the most predominant. Right, that's what I was thinking, right. Easy to grow. Yeah, so you so you think you're treating one bug and you have the right anti antibiotic or antimicrobial for that individual bug, but there can be multiple other organisms that are going untreated. Yeah, so they, they all have a role to play, you see, and a lot of them are, are called viable but non-culturable. If we take a molecular view of a wound, for example, you can potentially find 30, 35 different species of bacteria in one wound. Whereas if we use a traditional culture method, you may recover two, three different types of bacteria. So we now know that this community that's developing has uh, implications in terms of infection and inflammation because we can get this thing called dysbiosis. It's shifting in microbiology. So we have to be very careful of how we manage these because it can be more problematic long term if we're not careful. Well, this is, I mean, Stephen, this is really fascinating and a lot more than I ever thought um, in terms of the complexity of what's going on here. You know, we tend to think of an infection as either it's infected or it's not. And I think it's pretty clear from what you're uh, describing that these infections can have their own set of attributes and characteristics uh, and can be, therefore be difficult to treat. 